Well, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Kimberly Kuhn, and I serve as the Executive Director for the National Spasmodic Dysphonia Association. As I mentioned, this webinar is being recorded and the links for the handout along with Christy's presentation will be available on the NSDA website on the webinar page. We're shifting the gears a bit today with Christy. The past two webinars that Christy has done have been focusing on uh, vocal techniques for spasmodic dysphonia and related voice condition, which were incredibly valuable. And I know we've received a lot of feedback, especially on your tips with the phone and using the microphone. Um, and so those are all available for, for viewing again if you need a refresher. Um, today is a little bit of a different slant. Um, it's the psychosocial and quality of life impairments of spasmodic dysphonia and related voice conditions. Christy is a speech language pathologist who specializes in the assessment, treatment, and research of spasmodic dysphonia. And that's out of which this presentation comes from, the research side of it. She currently works as a clinical voice specialist at, at the voice program at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. She has lectured for graduate and medical students. And she has provided hospital in-services presentation on voice treatment and has presented at research conferences both for the NSDA and at the American Speech Language and Hearing Association. This topic is very personal to Christy because she herself also has spasmodic dysphonia, which gives her a unique insight to this disorder as a researcher, a patient, and a clinician. And I'd also like to thank Christy for participating in our 2020 virtual symposium, which just took place on Saturday. Um, Christy was part of an excellent living with a vocal condition uh, panel that really resonated with so many people. And that is also available for viewing on the NSDA website or our YouTube channel. And we also thought that the webinar that Christy had put together, parts one and two, was so valuable that we included that as part of the programming for the symposium. And now I turn it over to you, Christy. Thanks, Kim. So hi, everybody. I hope everybody's doing all right and hanging in there. So like Kim said today, I will be shifting gears a bit and talking more about the psychosocial symptoms. So really shifting towards what it's actually like dealing with a voice disorder beyond just the voice symptoms alone. So I'm gonna share the screen with you just so I can share this presentation. Okay, so just for a little bit of a background, so spasmodic dysphonia is typically characterized by its physical presentation. So more of the strained, strangled voice quality, the voice breaks, the breathiness perhaps, or the effortful voicing. And so management of SD is really currently primarily based on a medical model to both assess and then address these voice symptoms. So as clinicians, we'll assess the sound quality and symptoms that we hear, and we'll also get an assessment of what patients perceive in the sound and feel of their voice. The Voice Handicap Index is kind of a measure of uh, handicap as to what, what one feels with the voice. So that's often used to measure level of voice handicap. And then the gold standard of treatment is still botulinum toxin injections or Botox injections to minimize these voice symptoms. And so I kind of wanted to look beyond just what we know are those typical classic voice symptoms and to really look at what is the quality of life impact for somebody living with a chronic voice disorder like spasmodic dysphonia. And so these psychosocial symptoms could encompass emotional distress, the loss of a job or change in job or job duties, reduced social participation, the inability to complete or participate in one's daily activities, the avoidances of the avoidance of situations, negative changes in personal relationships, um, and then also some negative thought patterns that might develop as well. And so these psychosocial symptoms can really look quite different from person to person that's dealing with SD and I think could look different because of a number of factors. So the severity of the SD, the kind of diagnosis process maybe, the coping strategies that one has, the self-efficacy of a person or their personality. And so I think this would look pretty different from person to person, um, but I think that most individuals with SD might experience some of these psychosocial symptoms at some point or another in their journey. 
And so I think it's important to also note that these psychosocial symptoms can happen at any stage of the disorder. So it can be in the pre-diagnosis stage when somebody is really kind of figuring out what they have in terms of voice symptoms, um, you know, struggling to get a diagnosis and figure out what is actually going on. The diagnosis itself can also lead to some psychosocial symptoms. So for some, getting a diagnosis might be a relief that they have a name to what they have. But, you know, for others, it can actually be, you know, a hard pill to swallow or, you know, can bring up a lot of psychosocial symptoms in itself because it's, you know, you're being told you have a long-term chronic disorder um, and that alone with kind of processing all of the information can be um, really difficult to process. And so then the individual goes through kind of the post-diagnosis phase, um, dealing with the disorder and kind of all of the kind of ups and downs of the disorder for the rest of um, a person's life. And so I think it's important to also note that these symptoms can exist whether a per person is getting treatment or whether they're not getting treatment. And so if a person is not getting treatment, um, they may be totally okay with the way that their voice sounds or feels, and they may have learned to accept that. Um, but they also might not be getting treatment for other reasons, like perhaps it's ineffective for them, like Botox might not work. Um, so they might still be experiencing a lot of psychosocial symptoms. So even those getting treatment can experience psychosocial symptoms. And I think that's important to recognize too. And for instance, if we take Botox, individuals can really just kind of make it like clockwork and not even realize that they have ESD when they get their Botox. But on the other side of things, some that receive the Botox injections might actually still go through a lot of psychosocial symptoms. And I think there's a number of reasons for this. The injections could be costly for some. They could be inconsistent or kind of variable from injection to injection. There's the whole side effect period for individuals. So there could be two to three weeks of these kind of negative side effects like the breathiness or the weaker voice or the kind of swallowing difficulties. Um, and then Botox is, you know, um, it's temporary. So a person will have to kind of go through this process and need this repeated treatment every, you know, maybe three to four months. And so even going through, even if it is effective for somebody, they could still have a lot of psychosocial effects just in terms of the context of the treatment itself. And so when we think of other treatments available, surgery can absolutely lead to psychosocial effects as well. Um, again, even if it's effective, the, even the decision to get surgery is a stressful and perhaps anxiety or um, fearful decision. And then we have voice therapy, which is the least invasive of them all. But I think voice therapy actually can also, you know, stir up some of these psychosocial effects, especially in the beginning stages of voice therapy. And so figuring out um, that it actually takes a lot of work and dedication and patience and that, you know, it's kind of a little bit of up and down in, in the beginning stages can also, you know, lead to a lot of um, psychosocial effects. And so I think uh, Carolyn Ziegler, or Carolyn Ziegler, I think, was talking about this at the NSDA symposium in terms of how you kind of have to face yourself with voice therapy. And I think that that is very true and kind of speaks to this point that it can be um, a very difficult journey, even though it could be really effective for people. So, you know, why are these psychosocial symptoms important? And I think, you know, number one, really fully understanding from a patient perspective of, of the full impact of the disorder is very important. But then to individualize treatment. So, you know, in order to really make treatment the most effective it can be, I think it's important to understand the individual psychosocial impact. So, you know, if a person decides, you know, not to get treatment, is it because they're okay with ESD or is it because treatment doesn't work? And maybe we can work with that patient to find something that, that is a little bit more effective. Um, for planning of Botox injections, you know, if a person is dealing with significant breathiness or significant side effects and that's 
possibly more debilitating than the actual SD symptoms themselves, we would want to work with a patient in, and know that in you know, do dosing their Botox. And so again, um, like I said, voice therapy, you know, we would want to work with the patient in terms of knowing these psychosocial effects and, and perhaps tailoring the treatment to addressing these. So if, you know, speaking on the phone is really significantly impacting one's quality of life, we would target that directly. Um, and then, you know, if these psychosocial symptoms are that severe for a person, and it goes outside of the scope of, you know, perhaps a speech language pathologist, then we would look into possibly referring out for, you know, a social worker or a mental health therapist to possibly better or uh, more effectively target those symptoms with, with individuals. So I wanted to share this image here. And so this is actually developed for stuttering. And I actually really like it because I think it's relevant to SD, at least from my perspective. And so this is the iceberg analogy of stuttering. And so this kind of depicts here that there's a very small percentage of stuttering that's above the surface. So maybe, you know, 10 to 20% of the stuttering is what we actually hear and what we see. But then there's this large portion of what a person who stutters deals with, and that's all under the surface and things that we might not necessarily see overtly. And so that would be, you know, symptoms like fear and shame, guilt, anxiety, hopelessness, isolation, or denial. And there could be more um, relevant to that as well, but these are all the kind of under the surface symptoms that really make up the majority of what a person who stutters deals with on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, you know, I bring this up because I think it's also relevant and possibly similar to what individuals with SD deal with in terms of, you know, what we hear and see might be the actual voice changes but there's likely a lot more to it than that of what a person is dealing with under the surface. And so when, as a speech therapist or speech pathologist, when we deal um, and treat somebody who has a stutter, we actually um, deal with these psychosocial symptoms a lot. And treatment is actually um, centered around these psychosocial symptoms. And that's because we know that we can't actually cure the stutter. And so we can't take away the stutter because um, there's no cure. And similar to SD, you know, we, we, the goal is not to cure it because it's neurological and we can't actually cure it. But what we can do is try to minimize the psychosocial effects or try to give a person strategies to make the either stuttering or voice symptoms a little bit less severe or a little bit more manageable. And so for stuttering, we really focus on accepting the stutter and you know, having a person become a lot more comfortable with the stutter, so decreasing the shame and decreasing the avoidances. And you know, we might have somebody um, engage in voluntary stuttering, so actually going up to somebody and stuttering on purpose. And so having a person get more comfortable with uh, other people's reactions to the stuttering or educating people about it to gain some more control and empowerment. And so I just wanted to share this because I think it's also relevant in terms of this talk when we talk about the psychosocial symptoms that are really about relevant to um, SD as well. So I wanted to delve into a little bit of a research study that I did in 2016 in collaboration with Dr. Celia Stewart, who is at New York University. And so this was a survey study that we did um, with individuals with only ADSD. We hope to be able to replicate it with AD at some points, but this was just with AD. And so thank you if any of you actually filled it out. Um, I think it's really important to not only clinicians to, to see this information, but I think also for individuals with SD because it's, it's validating that if you have some of these psychosocial symptoms that you're not the only one, and that most people with a chronic communication disorder do deal with some of these psychosocial symptoms. And so we wanted to see what are the most prominent psychosocial symptoms that exist in spasmodic dysphonia along with the voice changes. We wanted to see what role these psychosocial symptoms play in the individual's perception of voice handicap, and so how they're viewing the voice handicap in the context of psychosocial symptoms. 
Is an individual's full experience with the disorder appropriately captured by the voice handicap index? And what symptoms are most important for professionals working with those with SD to really truly understand when they have a patient with SD sit in, sitting in front of them? And so this was the sample that we used. Um, it was 127 participants with ADSD. We had a wide age range from 21 to 81. There were mostly females who participated, but 30 males. The age at diagnosis ranged from 11 to 74. Most were typical onset age, and then we had a, almost 30% were early onset. The, in terms of treatment methods, about 80% had received Botox injections at one point, and 71% received speech or voice therapy at one point um, in their journey. And then for current treatment at time of the study, 41% were receiving Botox injections. About 40% almost were not actually receiving any treatment, which, you know, to my, in my perspective, is actually a, a pretty high number. And then a small percentage were taking medications, receiving voice therapy, or had had the uh, laryngeal surgery. And so we broke down these symptoms into different categories. And so the one on the left in, the, in gray is really these typical voice symptoms that we really primarily look at right now, which is the strain, the roughness, the breaks, the ones that we really classify um, as SD typical symptoms. But then we look at these ones in blue on the right, which are really these psychosocial symptoms. And this is what I'm gonna focus on today. And so we have these personal factors, which we coined as the kind of emotional experience. So the negative emotions that results from BSD, the cognitive thought patterns. So that includes the acceptance of the disorder, the thoughts about one's speaking voice and how it sounds the thoughts about speaking itself and maybe how much work it is, um, or the actual mechanics of speaking, the changes in self-view, so maybe um, changes in how one is actually seeing themselves because of the disorder, and then behavioral changes, so avoidances of not only people, but of different places where um, a person might know that it'll be difficult for others to hear them or difficult to speak. And then that also includes hiding the voice problem from other people. And then we look over here to the activities and participation domain. And this includes interference, so reduction in participation in daily activities. So, you know, perhaps um, speaking on the phone, a person will maybe speak on the phone less or uh, choose to be less sociable because of the SD. Changes in professional roles like jobs or careers or changes um, in a family role, or changes in relationships themselves. And then that also includes changes in enjoyment of these activities. So perhaps an individual is no longer enjoying socialization or you know, speaking with friends as much as they once did. And then we look at these environmental factors, and this is really how different communication, different communication situations can really affect an individual's choice to speak or can affect um, how they're experiencing their voice symptoms. So I'm gonna go through each category and just look at some of the most prominent symptoms in each of these categories. So I'll start with a personal category here. And so when we look at the emotions over here on the left, we see, so um, the M is the mean of everybody's responses. So the higher the mean, basically more individuals indicated towards the end of the scale that was strongly agree. And so most participants with a mean of over four were indicating either that they agreed to the statement or strongly agreed. And so the most prominent symptom here in the emotions category was feeling self-conscious followed by feeling frustrated, annoyed, feeling less confident, angry, anxious, and then anxiety in preparation of speaking. And so it's kind of not really a surprise that we see such strong emotions, um, especially for something that somebody has to deal with long-term. And then we shift over to the thought and cognitive patterns and people are feeling like they can't express their thoughts and opinions in the way that they want. And so they might be shifting the words that they use or saying less um, or just not talking at all if they have something to say. 
Um, I think this one below that it was hard to accept a lifelong disorder upon initial diagnosis. That to me is something that's um, really important to note and, and something that's maybe not acknowledged as much. And I talked about this on the um, symposium panel about how accepting the disorder was actually difficult for me at first as well. And so I think it was that acceptance piece that actually opened the door for me to be able to better deal with the, um, the disorder and diagnosis. But I think that was a really difficult piece, at least for me initially. And it, it seems like, you know, that's definitely something that other individuals with SD deal with as well. And so, you know, individuals were feeling like the voice did not represent their personality or that the personality has actually changed due to the voice disorder. So perhaps becoming more shy or reserved or just, you know, feeling less outgoing because of the voice disorder. Individuals were believing that strangers were making judgments on their personality just based on the voice, whether that is true or not, individuals were holding that belief that others were just judging them based on the sound of the voice alone. Um, not being able to focus on the message because the individual is focused on um, the actual sound of the voice. And I think that's important because that's limiting, you know, the point of communication is to express what sh your message and to express what you want to say and to be focused on the sound of the voice kind of takes a lot away from that actual message. And so this last one here, I think is very interesting to rehearse what you want to say in your head before saying it out loud. And I know I've done this before as well, um, you know, before you answer the phone or before you go to, you know, put in, uh, in order in at the restaurant or when you're at the drive through right, you kind of get in this um, perhaps thought pattern of even thinking about what your voice is going to sound like or, you know, just even rehearsing that whatever you're going to say in your head. Um, so I think that's a really powerful thing to note as well. And then there's these behavioral changes. So individuals are indicating when their voice is bad um, or when they feel like their voice is bad, that they are avoiding um, socializing with people that they don't know well. And perhaps this is related to feeling like individuals are going to judge them without really knowing who they are. And then again, um, individuals were also not just avoiding people they didn't know well, but also avoiding socializing with friends, even people who they did know well, perhaps because of the effort, but maybe because of also um, this kind of piece of, of the judgment that they were feeling. So when we look at the environmental category, basically this indicates that individuals were not as comfortable speaking in large groups or speaking to authority figures as before the voice problem. And speaking to authority figures, I think, is one that is unique to SD. We don't really hear this often with or as often with other voice disorders, but you definitely um, note this in individuals with SD. And I think it could be, again, the um, just that kind of negative thought process um, uh, or the anxiety surrounding speaking. And then individuals were evaluating the situation, the situation around them and the potential effects of speaking before talking. And so I think this is interesting too because individuals were actually deciding whether or not to say what they wanted to say depending on you know, who's there, what kind of group it is, what the background noise looks like. Um, so I think that's, can really, that can really impact your quality of life um, if you are choosing just not to say what you want to say, even if you have something to say. And so then we shift to the activities and participation category. And overall, individuals were enjoying activities less. And so enjoying going to restaurants less, most people indicated agree or strongly agree to that. Um, enjoying communicating or social, socializing with friends a lot less, which I think is, that can be severely limiting in terms of quality of life if, you know, you're unable to enjoy that process and it almost becomes more of work or effort rather than a process of enjoyment. And then speaking on the phone is one that we hear a lot and that one's not all too surprising here. And then individuals were also, you know, commenting that the voice interferes with their success in work and school. And I think, you know, that's, that's can be severely debilitating as well if it's really getting in the way of what a person needs to do with their career or schoolwork. And so just to comment on the symptoms that we looked at, which are these actual voice symptoms, 
the dislike of the sound of the voice was the um, the symptom, the most prominent symptom out of, out of everything that we asked in the survey. And so the mean here is 4.75, which indicates that the majority of participants were indicating strongly agree to this item. So they were strongly agreeing that they disliked the sound of the voice, which is not all too, um, you know, unsurprising when we think about this. And then we look at, you know, how individuals are thinking about the process of talking. So talking is no longer automatic and individuals are really having to think about how they're talking and not just what they're saying, which can really, again, take away from, um, you know, being able to communicate and communicate your message. And so then we see below here are just the typical voice breaks of vocal effort and strain that these are the ones that we typically see. So we also correlated um, these, each of these categories, these psychosocial categories with the voice handicap to see which one was the most related to voice handicap or how an individual is judging the severity of the voice handicap for themselves. And so we see that the personal category, which again includes the emotions, the behavior changes like avoidances and the changes in thought patterns, the personal category was actually the most related, the most correlated to voice handicap. And that was more strongly correlated than just the body function structure category here. And that includes just the voice symptoms. So basically the emotions, the behaviors and the thoughts were more related to how an individual is judging their voice handicap than just the strain, than just the breaks alone. And so this is pretty important to you know, pay attention to these psychosocial symptoms because it's highly related to an individual's voice handicap. And so then we looked at these individual items for, from the survey and we wanted to see how related each of these was individually to voice handicap. And so we looked at, so we found that hopelessness was actually the um, symptom that was most strongly correlated and most strongly related to voice handicap, which is a pretty, um, it's a pretty significant finding here. And it's, um, I think, important to note, and hopelessness is not a light emotion, right? That's um, something pretty, can be pretty devastating to somebody. And so understanding that piece of it and maybe thinking about how we can provide more hope for individuals dealing with SD is definitely a worthwhile um, approach, I, I would say, for treatment. And then helplessness, similar to hopelessness, individuals were feeling lack of control over their treatment course or over the disorder as well. So that was the second most related symptom to voice handicap, followed by the belief that others treat them as less intelligent. Um, which I did not expect that one to be the third most correlated to voice handicap, but it does make sense that if everybody is kind of, if they're thinking that everyone is treating them as less intelligent, that that definitely has a strong relation to quality of life and voice handicap. And then anger about his or her voice was the fourth most related. And then voice breaks was actually fifth. And so there's four of these psychosocial symptoms that come before any voice symptom in relation to voice handicap. And so I think that that also shows these psychosocial symptoms are really important to start to pay attention to. And so the last thing here we looked at was prediction of each of these categories to the voice handicap. Um, and so the ability of each of these categories to actually predict how an individual was going to judge the severity of the handicap. And so the personal category, again, was the best predictor of voice handicap. And that was a better predictor for um, you know, the, the level of voice handicap than was this category up here, the body structure and function. And again, the personal category is these emotions and the behavioral changes and the body structure and function is just these voice symptoms that we typically focus on. So if the personal category is better predicting voice handicap, we should really be focusing on these um, emotional effects, behavioral responses and thought patterns and see how we can um, perhaps shift these in somebody with SD. So I wanted to include kind of the insider's experience. So, you know, we asked the question, what do you want treating professionals to know about your disorder? So when you're sitting in front of them, what do you want them to really understand? Not just that you have these voice symptoms, but what it's really like. And so individuals commented that it's handicapping, it's frustrating, it leaves them hopeless, um, it's isolating, exhausting, or life altering. 
that it changes um, somebody's personality. It can affect the whole being. It's not about the voice alone. So I think that's really what, what we're talking about today and that really hits home of that. It's not just about the voice. It affects every aspect of a person's life or certainly could. And um, it impacts them emotionally. The voice doesn't appropriately reflect who they are. Um, being able to talk is being alive and being a person. And so to kind of lose that automatic function could, you know, perhaps rob you of life in a slightly different way. And so while it's a disability, it does not affect intelligence, which is what we were just talking about. And then the person here says, you know, it interacts in all facets, facets of one's life. And speaking with ease is something we take for granted until it's gone. And I think that's absolutely true. And speech is something that's highly automatic until it, something goes wrong, until it's not. And then once that, you know, becomes a lot less automatic, um, it can be severely handicapping or can severely affect quality of life. And then this one here, I think, is very powerful at the end. It says the grief and the loss and the fact that it seriously affects loved ones. And I think describing it as a process of grief or loss is really powerful and something that is very true. You know, it could be an actual process of grief that somebody goes through a process of loss because they are losing, you know, maybe the way of life that they once knew it or losing, you know, the ability to speak in the same way that they once knew. And the NSDA actually has a great depiction of this on their website of kind of going through these stages of grief. And so it's under the uh, personal journey section. And I think it's a really good depiction of what some people might go through. And you can go through the stages of denial or anger and acceptance finally. And it is almost like an actual loss or grief process. And so, you know, we know that SD results in significant psychosocial impacts, and that's what we're talking about here. And so these psychosocial symptoms can really exist in those even getting treatment. Um, and that the emotional, behavioral, and cognitive effects, cognitive effects of living with SD might be actually more debilitating than the physical voice symptoms alone. And psychosocial symptoms, so these symptoms that we talked about today may not be fully captured by the VHI or our current standard voice handicap scales that we use for maybe other voice disorders. And I think SD is very unique in that way that it's chronic um, and it's long-term or incurable. And you know, I think the CPIB is something that's going to be really great. Um, you guys can learn more about that if you didn't see the lectures in the symposium, but um, that's a scale that's being validated for individuals with SD to look more at the um, handicaps in participation. And I think something like that is definitely warranted and definitely needed to maybe better capture the impact the, or the full impact of this disorder on an individual. And so, you know, how can we better address these psychosocial symptoms? Um, and again, is this VHI sensitive enough to capture all of these symptoms? So, I found this image and I wanted to just circle back here because I love it. it so somebody who stutters actually made this. And so this is about reframing the stuttering iceberg. And I think this, again, can really apply to SD. And so it's kind of thinking about how we can go from the picture on the left. So and feeling all these strong negative psychosocial symptoms to maybe starting to feel more of these positive symptoms in place of the negative ones. So maybe shifting denial to acceptance or fear to courage or strength or shame to pride, anxiety to comfort, isolation to finding community, you know, feeling guilt to expressing kindness um, or from feeling hopelessness to really feeling a sense of hope. And I talked about this um, on the panel of my personal experiences with SD in, in terms of, you know, feeling that acceptance piece and shifting my perspective from, you know, feeling like it made me weak to really feeling like it's something um, that can give you strength. And, you know, I think individuals can find community in the NSDA support groups um, or find that piece of hope in maybe working with your speech language pathologist or otolaryngologist to really tailor your treatment to something that does work for you. And so we also asked a question um, to others about, you know, what has helped you in most dealing with this disorder? And again, people indicated the support groups, 
the NSDA symposium and website, Facebook support groups, um, having a trustworthy and competent otolaryngologist or SLP, accepting it, finding humor or the positive light side, um, accepting or having accepting and understanding people around you in a good support system and trying to decrease these life, overall life stressors. And so, you know, perhaps we can look towards maybe increased treatment options, which many researchers are now um, working on, um, investigating more treatment options to decrease the level of hopelessness for patients. Um, perhaps we can target this more in voice therapy. And so voice therapists don't just treat the actual voice symptoms, but we'll work with an individual to maybe help them increase their participation in daily activities or to be able to feel more comfortable speaking on the phone or speaking you know, to somebody they just meet. That's a big part of you know, speech or voice therapy is finding what the uh, most impairing symptoms are in terms of quality of life for somebody and really working to manage those or give somebody a little more control or self-empowerment. Um, I think promoting education and understanding not just among yourselves, but amongst family members or friends or even the medical community um, of people who are maybe not as familiar with SD, that can be empowering in itself, but also can be really helpful for the community as a whole in promoting that education and, and really being an advocate for others with SD. So if you want um, any further reading, um, these are just my references, so you can feel free to look at any of these if you'd like. And um, a big thank you to the NSDA for just having me um, here and inviting me to do these webinars. It's been such a pleasure being able to share some of this information, and I hope that it's been helpful in some way to, to some of you. Um, again, these webinars will be posted along with a handout in the slide. Um, so you can go to dysphonia.org for a lot of more information and information specific to what I talked about here to, today too in terms of dealing with this um, personal journey of SD. This is my email, so if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. If you have any comments of your journey, I'm happy to um, hear any comments that you have. And then I also have a blog here at this website as well. So kind of speaking more towards my dual perspective um, as a speech language pathologist, but also somebody who deals with SD and kind of more on my personal journey and dealing with all these um, voice symptoms. Um, so check that out if you'd like. And I'll switch gears here and answer some questions. So if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to um, shift over and answer some of those. All right, these here. And Christy, we do have one. Um, yeah. phone, phone usage seems to be public enemy number one. How can we overcome wanting to avoid phone contact and deal with the negative thought patterns associated with it? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so the phones, the dreaded phones. Um, so phones are really difficult for anybody with a voice disorder, especially with SD. And I think, you know, learning some voice therapy strategies. So I've talked about this before um, in the prior webinars. So warming up your voice maybe before a phone call because the goal is to try to gain more control. And so knowing where your voice is coming from before you even start, um, I think that could be really helpful. Getting your voice really forward before you start. Using headphones can be really helpful in terms of um, gaining more control. I think also, you know, telling people about it before you start a phone call could be helpful for some people. So if you know your voice is just not great that day, maybe telling somebody as soon as you get on the phone call, just so you know, I have a voice disorder. It just affects the sound of my voice. Um, if you can just bear with me for a second, you know, that could be really helpful for somebody as well. Um, so I think there's a lot more to that, but those are things that I think could help, you know, starting out to decrease the anxiety, or practice on the phone call, practice with somebody you might know really well, um, and start to get more comfortable, even if the voice breaks, in not letting that kind of lead to those negative thought patterns, but being more accepting and just trying to, you know, flow through that, work through that. And then there's a follow-up question. Do you think it helps to use a speakerphone for phone calls? 
Yes, absolutely. So the, I usually either use speakerphone or I'll use um, a headset. So um, I like that there's kind of an input microphone here, but when I don't have my headphones, I'll definitely use speakerphone and I'll hold it close to my mouth like this. And so the voice is kind of trailing directly into the phone rather than me feeling like I have to strain if I'm holding it more up here. So I definitely think that can be really helpful. And then there was a follow-up co comment. After one of your recent programs, I purchased a headset with a microphone that wraps around to my lips. It really seems to cut back on the stress of talking on the phone. Great idea. Great. And yeah. then um, another question, and actually this is from Facebook. We are streaming on Facebook Live, so that's really kind of cool. Um, I've had people actually mock me when my voice breaks. I mean, an adult. How do I deal with that? Yeah, so I think, you know, one, educating people. I think part of it is that individuals don't even understand um, what a voice disorder is, never mind what SD is. So I think taking that opportunity to maybe step back and educate somebody and just say, listen, this is, I have a voice disorder and this is why my voice sounds like this. Um, and so if you want more information, I'm happy to give you more information. And I think people kind of understanding that it's a voice disorder can really help um, minimize that. And um, I think being open about it and that education piece in telling others the, the reason behind it can uh, be helpful. But, I, you know, I think that's a really tough situation. And, and I think, you know, a lot of people have been in that boat um, of the kind of the, experiencing the negative reactions of others. And, you know, I think being more comfortable, being open about it is something that can kind of decrease the shame and um, allow people to be more understanding of what's going on. Do you ever tell people that you just have a cold? Some people have made comments like that, like they just, they don't get into it at all. And I think it's probably situational, but any thoughts about that too? Yeah, so to be honest, I used to do that sometimes. Um, I used to just say yes when people would say, oh, you sound terrible, you know, you should go rest. And I would just say, yeah, yeah. Um, or just say, yes, I have a cold. Um, now I don't really as much, even if I have a bad voice day, I will, I will take the opportunity to educate people when I can. Um, you know, if it's a, I think that's a really personal decision though. If it's a very quick conversation, um, and you don't really feel like going into the whole explanation of SD, you can do that. Um, I think it's always a great opportunity to educate somebody about the SD. But again, if it's somebody you don't know well, um, and you're just speaking to them over the phone for five minutes, and you're, you know, you just kind of need to get through the conversation, you, you can do that. Um, and I know many people will say yes to that as well. Um, but I think it's a great opportunity if you can, and if you're willing to educate the person, even just very briefly, a few sentences about the voice disorder. Um, and then there's another comment. These kind of brief interactions um, make me angry and actually increases my fear of speaking. So any thoughts mm -hmm. about, you know, maybe taking a pause or anything like that? Yeah, so I think, again, it's, it's the kind of cycle of those negative reactions and then how they're feeding into your thought patterns too. And, you know, we, we talk about this sometimes with individuals who stutter too, and it's, it's maybe the person is thinking less about your voice than you think. Um, maybe, maybe they notice it um, or, you know, you notice um, their reaction, but they're probably a lot less focused on you and your voice um, than you think. Um, and so I think not letting yourself kind of go down that road of that whole negative thought process cycle um, and just, you know, again, maybe taking the opportunity to be open about it. And I think that can make you yourself more comfortable um, because I think if a person understands where it's coming from, they're a lot less likely to react in a negative way because they understand that it's, it's a vocal disorder. Um, but I think, you know, I think that's really hard. And I think that's one of the toughest parts about living with SD, especially in the beginning phases is that, you know, those, those, um, perceived negative reactions. But I think, you know, 
educating people and trying not to go down that whole negative thought pattern um, cycle and just saying, okay, this is one person, this is their opinion. Um, so even if they don't understand it, kind of just accepting it yourself and then moving on um, can be helpful. We have another question that came in. Before I was diagnosed with spasmodic dysphonia, I was referred for voice therapy. I remember being emotional while filling out the intake form, apologizing to the voice therapist, and not getting any feedback. I now realize that I need to find a voice therapy group that understands the emotional aspect of this. How does one find such a therapist? Yeah, so I think, you know, as SLPs, we are trained um, to counsel individuals with um, any sort of communication disorder. And that's a big part of what we do is being able to go beyond just the voice symptoms and really understand what the person in front of us is dealing with. Um, again, talking about all those quality of life effects and emotional effects. And if you find that you know, you're going to somebody and they don't fully understand your um, voice disorder or they're not really getting at what's important to you, you can bring it up and see if, if that's something that they're willing to target with you. But if you really feel like they're not understanding your voice disorder, definitely go to somebody who this is all they do. You know, if they work with people with voice disorders perhaps, or, you know, they work with people with even chronic communication disorders. And so they fully understand it. Um, you know, if you're seeing a a speech pathologist who works with, you know, pediatric patients all day and then, um, you know, perhaps sees a few adults that might look different than somebody who's doing voice um, all the time or who's working with chronic communication disorders all the time. So the NSDA is a great um, listing of healthcare providers that do, you know, offer services to individuals with SD and are specifically focused on SD. I would say uh, providers who work with an otolaryngologist in a voice center, voice program, they deal with SD pretty frequently, and so they should have a good understanding of SD. Um, if you're having trouble, email me. Um, I'm happy to kind of point you in the right direction of somebody in your area. But I would, you know, if you don't feel comfortable with, with the speech pathologist, um, it is warranted, you know, to go to somebody that you do feel comfortable with. And I think that's a big piece of the therapy process is, establishing that trust and collaborative relationship with um, the patient and the uh, provider. But I would check the NSDA website of the provider listing and see if somebody can possibly do telehealth with you. And again, you know, um, email me if you're having trouble, I'll shift you in the right direction, hopefully, um, for somebody that might be able to help. And any thoughts about um, how to cope with SD um, as a teacher or in other uh, professions that are heavy voice users? Yeah, so, you know, the heavy voice user population can be hit really hard by this, especially now, um, you know, with virtual lectures or online speaking duties. Um, so if you haven't, I would go back to the first two webinars and see if any of those strategies would be helpful in kind of managing and better compensating for voice symptoms, especially, you know, speaking virtually or speaking on the phone. Um, I went through a lot of tips that could be helpful for that. Um, you know, seeing if you can take breaks or, or set up your schedule to be able to have some voice breaks in between what you're doing. So if you are you know, lecturing, maybe you can break up your lecture. So instead of doing maybe a four hour lecture, you can do, you know, pieces of it and take a break in between, um, you know, or speak with your supervisor about how you can maybe um, shift some of your duties. Maybe you can do part lectures and then, you know, part admin work. Um, I know everybody doesn't have, you know, such flexible jobs, but think about maybe creative ways that you can start to you know, use those uh, strategies like email or um, nonverbal communication when you can. And then when you have to be talking, use those voice strategies that we talked about, but see if you can set up your schedule so that you have those kind of moments of relief or break in between your day. And to circle back again, um, we had a comment from Facebook. I've actually had people say, please don't try to talk and basically try to shut me down. It's very hurtful. Any thoughts or comments on how to pivot that kind of conversation? 
Yeah. I mean, again, I, I would educate and I would say, you know, I'm not sure if you know, um, I actually have a voice disorder and it just affects the way that my vocal folds work or vocal cords work. And um, this is the sound that comes out. So if you, you know, wouldn't mind bearing with me while I try to get my words out, um, that would be great. So you can say something along those lines. So you don't have to go really in depth. It doesn't have to be a huge explanation, but somebody can really understand, oh, I didn't realize that they had a voice disorder and that this is something they can't control. Um, and I think that generally will change somebody's reaction. Um, I would say that would probably be the most helpful. Um, and then, you know, if it's, if it's, somebody who understands what you're going through and they, they really still have negative reactions. Um, you know, then you have decisions personally, um, you know, if people are understanding what you're dealing with, but really still not accepting it. Um, that's kind of something that you can manage personally um, on a more personal level of, of who's really going to be your biggest supporters um, versus, you know, who might not fully understand it. Um, and I think it's hard for people maybe to fully understand all those you know intricate psychosocial symptoms because they're not going through it and they think maybe that it's just the sound of the voice um but i think if you take that opportunity to really explain how it impacts you that could be really um, beneficial in terms of turning that interaction around wonderful there was another comment i only now realize the emotional facet is normal i remember feeling embarrassed that i felt emotional about my voice disorder and then, and then another comment was seen in black and white was what is so common to many of us is strangely reassuring and comforting. And um, it's a powerful ending in moving to hope and acceptance, courage and community. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think that validation piece, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to share this too, the validation piece is so important because if you're experiencing this, you're certainly not alone in this. Um, and many individuals with SD will feel very similar um, experiences at one point or another. So even seeking out a support group and speaking with others with SD about this, I think can be really, really validating also and helpful in managing these really strong, significant emotions. Wonderful, Christy. Well, thank you for such an insightful webinar. I know we went a little bit over, but I think it was so important to have these questions responded to and, and share just a little bit more about what it's like. Um, we will be continuing. Um, we're going to be working on a whole new series of webinars. Um, and so please let us know what topics are of interest. Is there something that we have talked about in the past that you would like to expand on? Or maybe there was a topic that Christy touched on today that um, we could go delve a little bit deeper into. And um, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today, both here on the webinar and on Facebook. And um, Chrissy, any final comments? Um, I would say just recognize again that whatever you're dealing with is normal if you're dealing with a lot of significant effects um, and that there is certainly the positive side to the disorder. Um, I spoke about this at the symposium, but there's definitely hope on the other side. There's definitely a positive side to the disorder. Um, so check out the NSDA for resources, the support groups, um, and connect with others who have it um, because you're certainly not alone and um, you, know, you can get that help to reach the other side of that positivity. Perfect. Thank you so much. We'll yeah. see everyone soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.